Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Rennick. I'm Senior Lecturer in Modern British History here at the University of York. And thank you for joining us this evening for this event, uh, Britain Alone, The Path from Suez to Brexit. Um, I have a few technical notes before introducing our speaker for this evening, uh, who I'll be in conversation with. Uh, if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen throughout. I'll be checking that. Uh, I'll make time at the end for questions, but if anything comes up throughout that seems particularly pertinent, I'll uh, come to it as soon as I can. Should you have any technical issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it again. Subtitles are available in this event. To turn these on or off, use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so uh, it's uh, now the moment to introduce our speaker for this evening. Um, that's Philip Stevens, who is an award-winning journalist and the chief political commentator at the Financial Times. He was previously director of the FT's editorial board, Throughout his career, he has had unique access to foreign policy makers in Britain and around the world. Philip won the David Watt Prize for Outstanding Political Journalism, the UK Political Studies Association's Political Journalist of the Year Award, and was Political Journalist of the Year in the British Press Awards. He is the author of Politics and the Pound and Tony Blair, and also this book, which we're here to talk about this evening, Britain Alone, The Path from Suez to Brexit. So thank you for joining us this evening, Philip. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be there. OK, so um, I thought maybe we could begin. Um, you've, you've, as I've just mentioned, you've previously written books about Tony Blair and the, the politics of the pound and exchange rates. This book um, takes a, a much longer and broader perspective, both chronologically and I, I guess across the globe as well. I wondered what, what were the origins of this book and what led you to write it? Well. It's partly um, a longer perspective because I'm older. <laughs> you know, if I, you know, uh, it horrifies me to say it, but I've been writing for the FT now for 38 years, and for most of the time, that's been about political economy, foreign policy, global affairs. So, quite a span. If you, you know, I've covered a span of 70 years or so, but quite a span of that um, uh, I've been involved in. But I suppose the main trigger was Brexit. And my sense from my own experience and my own interest in, in modern history was that Brexit was just part of a much wider tapestry. Uh, a story really that starts with the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the dissolution of empire. And it's a story in which um, Britain is forever struggling to, um, to reconcile its past with its future, to reconcile uh, a future as a, you know, a, a, a significant but second rank power with a past which had seen us, you know, ruling, you know, a quarter of the globe with its vast empire. And so I think the Brexit was part of that story and a bookmark in that, in or a bookend in a way in that story. I mean, the book just to, to finish off, the book starts with a warning given in the late 1940s by um, uh, a, a scientist in Whitehall who actually served Churchill during the war, a chap called Henry Tizard. And he says, he says in a note, look, you know, Britain is still a, uh, a great nation, but if we keep pretending that we're still a great power, we'll end up ceasing to be a great nation. And I think that struggle between great nation, great power has been, has been shot through our foreign policy and our domestic policy ever since. And I think it was a big part of Brexit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's interesting. I mean, actually that's um, um, perhaps an opportunity moment to, um, for you to give uh, the audience maybe um, a, a flavor of, there's obviously, as you say, a 70-year you know, gap between Suez and, and, and Brexit. Uh, there are events that are um, uh, connected in lots of different ways. 
Uh, and and throughout the book, you, you provide this 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 narrative that explains the the, the various different different paths that, that we have from the early 1950s until uh, till the present. And um, I wondered what what would you identify as being the key moments and developments as kind of staging posts between Suez and Brexit, uh, but yeah, the things that get us to this point. Well, I think you know Suez was was the sort of um, you know, was in, in its way the end of um, imperial illusion because it was the moment we were forced to realize because we had to withdraw at the behest of the Americans um, that we were, were no longer a global power. Um, we could no longer send a gunboat here or an army there and get our way. Um, and it pushed us back into thinking about you know, where, where we sat in the sort of geopolitical landscape. And the tussle then was, were we, we weren't a global power, were we a European power? And so that took us into that, that, the sort of staging, the first staging post was that big debate about whether we join the European common market as it then was. And the people who wanted to go in were saying, look, we've got to recognize that we're, now a European power, a big one, and we still have lots of global interests and the Commonwealth, but we're not like the Soviet Union and we're not like the United States. We're, we're not one of, Churchill used to call the big three anymore. So you had that debate, which, you know, in the 1970s, uh, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and we eventually got in. So that was one big chunk, but we never quite, although we joined the common market, we never quite settled in it. And Margaret Thatcher, although, you know, contrary to what's often written now, was a convinced European, never thought it was enough. And she felt we had this period during the 80s where, you know, she was dancing on the world stage, as it were, with Ronald Reagan. She was much more in, uh, emotionally and at heart uh, a, um, an Atlanticist, uh, someone who thought, we could revive the Anglosphere of English speaking nations. So Churchillian again, construct of, you know, why can't the world be run by the US and um, uh, the UK and Australia and Canada and New Zealand. Um, but that didn't quite work anyway. So we, and so we got into this awkward position where with Washington, we were trying to be, you know, it, it was the special relationship uh, to quote Macmillan, we were trying to be Greece, the wise Greece, to the sort of rather sort of bumbling, uh, uh, cr crude American Rome, uh, and keep a foot in the European Union. And in a way, we managed to do that. We, you know, it was awkward sometimes, but we were more successful, I think, than uh, than we gave ourselves credit for. The single market was, you know, really a British invention and. Uh, but then we had these big shocks in the 1990s with um, uh, two big shocks, one with Maastricht and the drive by France and Germany for a single European currency and the, uh, the defenestration by her own party of Margaret Thatcher and the expansion then of, of the European Union to include Central and Eastern European countries. So, there always been this tension within when the Conservative Party was pro-European, Labour was anti, when Labour was pro, the Tories were anti. But what happened, I think, in the 1990s, that in the Conservative Party, Euroscepticism really became anti, began to become anti-Europeanism. And there you have the full circle, because you, you can see it now, you had a lot of pro-Brexit people or Eurosceptics or whatever you want to call them saying, look, we're not a European power. Back to the argument of the 50s saying, we're global Britain. You know, we're not like the French or the Germans or the Italians or the Spanish. We need to break out. So in a way, the circle had turned and the argument that had been won, if you like, by the pro-Europeans after Suez was then lost. And now we have this according to the Prime Minister, this construct called Global Britain. Uh, no one's quite sure what it is, um, but that's what we apparently are now. We're going to, um, 
we're going to send an aircraft carrier out to, to, to the South China Sea just to prove that we're global Britain. Yeah, interesting. I wondered, um, I mean, one thing that, that seemed um, very, very clear and you bring out very well um, is that, that uh, as you were just reflecting there, with things like the, the single market and particularly the, um, the direction of travel in terms of um, economics in the, the, the late 70s, 1980s in the European Union, um, Britain seemed to uh, be, be a a major player to be really kind of um, leaving an imprint on the European project. But that isn't necessarily something that you would guess from the way in which the European Union is covered and the way that people think about it within this country. Um, it's always seen as being perhaps something that is done to us rather than something that we have shaped in a particular way. Um, and I guess we saw that a lot in the referendum with with the talk of kind of you know red tape and bureaucracy and you know things like that um, yeah. i wonder whether why it is that you think that we that, that in this country we've never been able to embrace that kind of positive impact on the european project well i think you're absolutely spot on in terms of that uh disjunction between what we actually achieved in europe and what we admitted or or claimed to have achieved and I'd say that, you know, we've been in our relationship with Europe been ruled by two emotions. Um, one has been a sense of superiority. You know, we're rather better than them. I mean, to put it rather crudely, we won the war, <laughs> never invaded. We stood alone. You know, we defeated fascism. Forget that the Americans and the Soviet Union may have had a sort of site, you know, a small role in that. But, uh, you know, our national story is about a British uh, victory. So on the one hand, there was this sense of superiority. But on the other, as we watched the Germans and the French and the Italians doing rather well economically, we became rather insecure about Europe because they seemed to be pulling away from us. And Europe then became a sense of, well, they're conspiring in some way against us. They want to pull us down. And those two emotions, I think, have sort of jostled um, with each other and certainly did in the in in the sort of in Margaret Thatcher's mind in the minds of the conserv much of the Conservative Party in the 80s and the media and the Rupert you know particularly the Rupert Murdoch the Murdoch media but also the Daily Mail and the Telegraph the right wing media which as I say began to step back to say look actually we're we're better we we we've got to be global and more Atlanticist um, and. It is, a, a, in my view, a, a tragedy. I think the other, the other, the other reason, and there's a genuine reason why we were we never quite settled, is that for other countries, for, for the founders of Europe, for France and for Germany and Italy, there was a real purpose. I mean, for Germany, it was about re-establishing its legitimacy, embedding a democracy. For France, it was for establishing France's political hegemony in Europe. For Italy, it was about holding itself together as a nation. And then post-fascism in Spain and Portugal and Greece, it was for those countries to guarantee their democracy. So they all had a, had a sort of binding purpose. And we sort of joined because we felt we had to. We didn't join with a sense of, this is what we want to do with Europe. This is what we want to get out of it. And we never quite sorted out that problem. Yeah, interesting. I wanted um, a question um, from an audience member here uh, asking about how um, the EU fits with, um, I guess, with globalism and with uh, the idea of a kind of global village and things like that. And, and that relates to something that I was thinking about when reading your book, which is the extent to which often um, politicians have have not really that somehow Europe is not proper foreign policy for lots of politicians they like to think in much broader terms and I wondered I wonder if your thoughts on you know what that state what the status of Europe is really for, for politicians uh, and, and you know kind of commentators in the country how it it fits and, and why um, something more global seems more exciting than, than something that clearly is foreign policy, but, but perhaps less geographic distance. Well, I think it is, you know, uh, really the legacy of empire and our 
familiarity with you know what you might call more exotic places around the world and the fact that you know we we have this large diaspora we have this large tradition of people you know still you know still live in asia in parts of in south south asia southeast asia east um uh, in africa and i mean i remember uh, there's during the debates about whether we should join the common market then as it then was in the uh, 1950s uh, Anthony Eden um, stood up and said, look, you know, when villagers, you know, in my constituency pick up their mail uh, in the mornings, if there are foreign stamps on that mail, they're not the stamps from of Germany or France or Belgium. They're the stamps of the Gold Coast, Tanganyika, Malaya, Burma and whatever. So this sense... So I think that, you know, I think empire, and I think it still has, it has left us and France has a certain, you know, has cer certainly um, has part, has a limited uh, 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 emotional attachment to this as well. That this sense that we are a global nation, we do have a global perspective, but the, the, the thing that's difficult to understand is why couldn't we do both? You know, why can't we be, and you know, people like Roy Jenkins, who argued very strongly in the 1960s for our membership, said, you know, you can be a European power with global interests and a global perspective. And we could have, when we joined the European Union, said, said this is what we bring. You know, we bring to this institution our wealth of experience, knowledge and interests around the globe. But we we didn't do it. We were too hesitant, too um, too niggardly. I think. Interesting. Um, we've had a question from from uh, an audience member, which relates actually to the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is um, uh, the question is about the, the phrase "our relationship with Europe," when maybe it, it should be posed more as our relationship in Europe. Europe. Rather, yeah. Rather than and you know, does this maybe reflect the ways that that the European project has been seen. And this, this relates to um, a, a question that I had. Um, there are a number of striking um, descriptions that you offer uh, in the book, and uh, some of which are drawn from, from uh, quotes from politicians, which is another issue we'll get to, onto in a moment. Um, but you, you describe um, Britain's relationship or, 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 or view of the European community and then the European Union, um, especially two decades before the first referendum. Um, you write that uh, it's defined by aloofness, hesitation and resentment followed when all other options have been explored by an unseemly scramble to climb aboard the European train. Yeah. Uh, and, and you offer uh, uh, you know, a, num uh, a number of moments when that, that, that happens that give a really kind of compelling story behind that. Um, and, and you take this further, you, you, you give um, a, a number of really, uh, really powerful vignettes of um, that, that back up the, the idea that in a lot of ways, um, large numbers of British politicians have, have been kind of waiting for the European project just to fail, uh, rather than to, to kind of positively impact it. But the most uh, recent example was um, that great description that you give of David Cameron's role in the discussions during the Eurozone crisis, uh, you know, refusing to turn up to meetings and things like that. Um, I wonder whether you thought, does, does Brexit draw a line under any of that stuff, or is that something that you think is is simply characteristic of our relation, uh, the way that we see our relationship to Europe and, and the political project there? I think drawing a line under any of this is going to be um, quite difficult, you know, partly just because of geography, partly because of the economic realities. Um, you know, we are, we're outside the European Union, but nearly half our trade and investment flows are still with the European Union. All the security threats we face, most of them, whether it's from Russia or from cyberspace or Iranian nuclear proliferation, whatever you want to choose, they're shared security threats with the rest of Europe. So drawing a line. But I think, again, you're right that you identified something that was there from the beginning, which was you know, Churchill was seen before and after the war as a great European. And he was one of the founding uh, lights in the Council of Europe. And he gave, gave, gave great speeches about the need for European unity, but it was for the rest of Europe to unite 
and we would stand as a sort of you know as a good friend on the margins of this but as one of the big three we wouldn't actually be part i think he you know he once said you know we're you know we're, we're um, with europe but not part of it and i think that sense of us being of course we have these shared interests but we're we also stand apart has run through and it's certainly been there with brexit but the problem is in a world in which you know the sort of you know the, the global rules the multilateral system is under strain and great power rivalries emerging again um we're not in a gang anymore as it were we were if there was one reason we joined you know geopolitical reason we joined the the european community in 1973 it was because we thought well there's the soviet union there there's america there united states and there's this new thing the european union there and these are three power blocks and here are we sitting outside all of them we better be part of it so that was that that's what if you Tha margaret thatcher's speeches in the 1970s on you know why we have to be part of it we're all about real politique they're not about the common market she famously in 1975 she says the reason we're joining is that we have um because this we need it for our security because it will open windows on the world that will otherwise be closed so yeah we've stood apart we will try and stand apart post brexit but economic political and security realities will keep pulling us back not necessarily to rejoin but we can't avoid the intimate connections that those things imply yeah interesting um a follow-up question from the audience there um that the um uh, things important is um to what extent and in what kinds of ways uh, so 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 the the stated ambition is is that the point of brexit is for is for britain to um to become or recapture however you want to view it uh, a status as a global power in, in what kinds of ways would you say brexit has impacted britain's ability to actually achieve that that goal that, that you know is it necessary for britain to be a member of of the european union in order to be a global power uh, if, if that makes sense well i think the other sort of another of the constant threads uh through the story which i tried to pull out in the book has been this collision between our ambitions you know our aspirations to play a global role and the economic realities which mean in areas of you know, spending and particularly in defense which means that we haven't been able to fulfill those ambitions so if you look through the 1950s and 60s you see a constant succession of what are called defense reviews where we're cutting expenditure and the big decision in 1968 where we pulled back from what was then called east of Suez. we we closed all our bases in um in south asia and in the gulf and said right we're pulling right all our troops back that was driven you know um by economic reality we can't we couldn't afford to keep that pose going now i think we're in exactly you know we are in if, if anything a rather worse position now because even the most ardent brexiteers i think now except there'll be a short-term economic from brexit uh now how are we going to finance these global ambitions and I mentioned earlier we've sent out we've got this grand new aircraft carrier the queen elizabeth that we've now sent out to asia to sort of demonstrate uh to you know, our allies and to the to china that we're you know another we're a naval power again but it's it's rather sad and embarrassing really because although this is i'm sure a fine aircraft carrier we can't afford enough aircraft to fly off it the aircraft that fly off the Queen Elizabeth are F-35s, which are the most expensive American aircraft. And we have most aircraft carriers you'd expect to have this size, 40, 50 aircraft. At the moment, we can only afford eight. 
So this aircraft carrier is going off with eight of our, with eight aircrafts on it. And that looks a bit silly. So what we've had to do is we've had to invite the American Marines to bring 10 of their aircraft on, onto it. So this, our flagship has literally become, we've literally become a sort of floating aircraft carrier for the US. Because they, we've also, we don't have enough ships to protect the carrier. I mean, carriers require all these destroyers and frigates um, to protect them against attack. So America is also supplying a destroyer as one of the escorts. So, you know, this is a sort of metaphor, I think, for, you know, we're going to have these, you know, in years to come, we're going to have more and more of these defense reviews where we say, well, look, we just can't afford to do all these things. And if you can't, you know, we can say now, look, we want to be back in the Gulf or we want to be back in the Mediterranean or back in Africa, but it requires money. And equally, you see on development aid, you know, an area where, you know, Britain really was making a mark carving out soft power across the globe, the, government's act, the government says it has to cut development aid because of COVID. So I, no, I think the story continues. We'll have these grand ambitions and then you know, we'll have to be kicking and screaming and we'll have to periodically admit that we can't afford them. Interesting. Um, I think one thing um, that I think is uh, interesting um, that you you bring up in the book and an audience uh, member has just asked about explicitly here is that, of course, the way in which we talked about this um, so far, specifically in terms of Britain and the, uh, the US and uh, the EU, um, and uh, as you mentioned previously, the USSR were the, the, the main points of reference uh, in terms of how uh, power was uh, distributed when your story begins. But of course, now we have other powers uh, on, the, on the scene, uh, most notably China, but also we think about India. Um, and so um, my, my question is really how, how those new powers um, change those aspirations of the of britain being a global power uh given the the changed geopolitical context and specifically um the, the audience members has, has asked about uh china and the relationship between china and the us and what that means for britain and its place in the world and the kind of path it should look to to chart whether it's it's simply a matter of uh following the us in these things or whether uh, Britain needs a different relationship with China at least. These problems. I wonder, so the kind of changing geopolitical context and the emergence of new powers, what difference that makes to, to this idea of globalism and global Britain? Well, absolutely. And it, it promotes, you know, more challenges and more complications. And the government came up recently with what it calls a comprehensive strategic review of our foreign and defence policy. Uh, in fact, it's actually it's quite an interesting document. It's quite well written, but actually it's a description of, of the world and, and the complications and complexities that you and the questioner have just mentioned, rather than a response to it in terms of a strategy for Britain. If you talk to people in Whitehall in Foreign Office or a Ministry of Defense privately, what they say is that outside, you know, having detached ourselves from Europe. There's only one choice, which is to move closer to the United States. And, you know, we've always been pretty much dependent, willingly so, on the US. But we're going to be more dependent on the US because we have no counterpoint. If we disagree with the US, we can't go to Europe, and if you like, and, you know, say we've got friends with us on this. So inexorably, we're going to be pushed towards the United States. And inexorably, that's going to mean that we are going to, if you like, have to keep closer and follow more closely American policy. Now, you can see that on China already. You know, we've moved from a policy which, I mean, personally, I thought was too accommodating of, of China, my own personal view. But we've moved to a policy now which is pretty close to the American policy, although rhetorically, we still talk about, you know, keeping trade opportunities open. I think the rhetoric's different. 
is rather different still. But again, going back to the aircraft carrier, one of the things the aircraft carrier is going to do is, is, uh, is going to sail through the South China Sea to demonstrate that Britain is on the side of the US in maintaining um, the South China Sea as an international waterway. This will infuriate the Chinese. And of course, we've fallen out with China over Hong Kong, and rightly so. And the government, I think, rightly has taken a hard, you know, a hard line in response to uh, snuffing out of freedom in, uh, freedoms in Hong Kong. But, you know, we, I think, you know, if you'd ask, if you ask, um, uh, if you were to ask the Prime Minister's foreign policy advisor, he would say, look, we can, you know, we have, we can put ourselves, we can be a convening power. We can, you know, put ourselves, you know, in the G7 and we can try and convene things there. We're in NATO, second biggest contributor to NATO. Um, we're in the Security Council, the, you know, permanent member. We can use all, and we, but frankly, we're not big enough to be a convening power. You know, if you, to be a convening power, you've got to be able to bring people with you. We can no longer bring the Europeans with us because not only have we left the EU, but we've also left on a very sour note and are continuing to fight with you know, these, these uh, EU countries. And the Americans are not gonna be convened by us. The Russians aren't gonna pay any attention to us and certainly the Chinese are. So I think you know, we become increasingly a, uh, you know, the special relationship becomes a you know, increasingly a supplicant relationship, a pliant relationship, um, and in, you know, increasingly we rely on you know to sort of I don't know walk in in, in America's shadow, uh, which is a great pity. And I think you know we had you know awkward though it was, we had. You know, we had a, you know, a foothold and a power base in Europe and a strong foothold and a power base in Washington. And that, that, there, there you had the sort of pillars of our foreign policy and Brexit blew up the European one. So the only one that's left is the American one. Something that you uh, brought up there um, has uh, prompted a couple of questions uh, from the audience, which we can, I think we can roll together, which is um, specifically on that topic of um, aid and development in an international context, which I think relates um, very strongly to one of the um, themes in your book, which you brought up already, which is the, the relationship between uh, domestic policy, domestic priorities, and foreign policy, um, which um, you, you've spoken about already this evening when you, when you mentioned, well, um, yeah, we, at the beginning of your story, that the pressing issue is, well, Britain simply can't hang on to its empire, it can't afford it, and this, this, these are the questions that, that, that run throughout. And as a couple of audience members have uh, highlighted here, um, this has come back to us now uh, in the present with this this decision to cut back on on uh, overseas aid um, because saying that we can't can't afford it uh, in the current context um, and that's of course something that's um, very unpopular uh, with commentators with with many many politicians many MPs uh, but also polls very well with the public, the idea of cutting back uh, uh, for the reasons that, that are given. But lots of people would, would have, have seen aid as being something that Britain does well. It's part of a, a kind of um, uh, Britain being a force for good in the world, something that, that means that we have a, a good reputation. So in that sense, it, it's kind of bound up with questions with how the rest of the world sees us. We talk a lot about global Britain as being something about us going out into the world when obviously we need to think about how everyone else sees us at the same time. Yeah. Um, I, I wondered you know, what you thought about those issues, about um, the attention to how, you know, us thinking about how the rest of the world sees us, whether aid and these kinds of things are things that, that are a pathway you know, towards um, a different kind of status and reputation for us. Um, and uh, and whether I suppose ultimately that's something we could ever consider doing because of the domestic constraints. 
Well, I mean, aid has, you know, for the last 50, 60 years, there's always been an element of political football in, in our aid budget in the sense that, you know, there's a body of people and MPs, politicians, and leaders, who always thought of aid is, you know, what we do because we have a moral responsibility to do to help the poorest, most deprived parts of the world. And a lot of them parts and, you know, and often connected with our empire, former empire and the Commonwealth and whatever. And, you know, back in the 1960s, I think it was Wilson's Labour government was the first to set up a, a permanent ministry for aid. Then there's another view of aid, which is we should use it much more pragmatically as a sort of as an instrument of foreign policy and an instrument of commercial policy and link it to our aid. So we give money to country Y because we want country Y to buy British machine tools or whatever. We want country Y to vote with us in the UN. And those two things have always been mixed, mixed up a bit. But I think we had moved to a position because, you know, with um, uh, the creation um, of DFID uh, and the hitting the UN target of 0.7%, which was, you know, introduced by Labour and endorsed and reinforced by the Conservative government of David Cameron, um, we'd reached a position where I think those two, those two had been there was an equilibrium there and aid had become part of our armory of soft power and influence in the world. And, you know, if, if people, other countries wanted to do things in the world of development, um, in the world, world of aid, they came to Britain as a center of expertise and the countries, the recipients and their neighbors saw Britain as, you know, a natural force for good. Now, Clearly, the present government just did not think about that, or if they did think about it, didn't care about that when they cut the aid budget um, for this year. And I think it was, you know, at the, at the G7, you know, the, this weekend passed. You know, how does it look when Britain is saying, look, we've got to, you know, give more, the, we, the advanced democracies, have got to do more for the poor countries hit by COVID when we are the only one of the seven who, who's actually, that's actually cut its aid budget this year. So you lose, if you like, moral authority, you know, you surrender. And I'm not sure now that, you know, I mean, there is always, there will always be a group of people who say, you've got to spend the money at home before you spend it abroad and, and it's wasted and whatever. Um, but those people and across the parties who think about foreign policy and our position in the world carefully understand that, you know, it's about, sometimes it's about security, sometimes it's about diplomacy, but a lot of the time it's about moral authority and you know, other people seeing what we do and our values and saying, well, hey, you know, there's something to, you know, something to follow there. So I think it's been a, threat, a terrible mistake, firstly, to abolish DFID, and secondly, to cut the budget this year. And I'm not, you know, I hope very much that, you know, this pressure will, rein, will get it reinstated, although I'm not that optimistic because the Prime Minister is quite stubborn about these things. I wonder whether, um, uh, you know, uh, building on a few things that you said there, um, one of the things that I found most fascinating about uh, about your uh, book is, uh, so, so yeah, I'm a professional historian, you're, you're a journalist, and your book offers really fascinating insights into, into high politics, diplomatic conduct, uh, the, these kinds of things. And I wonder whether you could um, say a bit more about um, how it is you go about getting those insights, the kinds of access that journalists have into these worlds that allow you to, to come to these judgments. And, and from that, your kind of, um, your reflections as a journalist on what it is that you think is most misunderstood about how these conversations are conducted, the kinds of decisions that politicians and policymakers come to. Uh, and I, I guess if I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear what it is that you think is most misunderstood about firstly what 
politicians and policy makers tend to get right, but also what they tend to get wrong and the reasons for it. Okay. Well, I think I've, you know, I've, you know, I've been at the FT for a long time and I've been, I think in many ways, uniquely privileged. I've done, you know, I was the economics editor and I, and as, as such, I used to go off to meetings of the International Monetary Fund and meetings of the, of the G5 and the G7 when they were the finance ministers, when they used to mess around with currencies in the 1980s. And then I was political editor so I was based at Westminster for six or seven years and uh, in this bunch of people who travel in the back of the prime minister's plane when they, when they went around the world. You know, in those days, Margaret Thatcher used to go around in a rather rickety VC-10. Um, uh, so you get, you see it close up, you know, I was, um, you know, and you, and you, you do get access to these people, uh, to the principals, to the prime minister, the foreign secretary, whatever, just because you're there all the time, you're in the House of Commons, you're in the back of the plane, you're at the press conference in Moscow, as well as at the press conference in Downing Street. Uh, you spend, you know, you spend a lot of time, if you're, you know, if you're serious about it, talking to the Foreign Office, to diplomats, to people at the Ministry of Defence, to people at DFID, uh, to people in the think tanks around Whitehall, where, so, uh, you know, a lot of what a lot of the things in the book, which I don't mark out as as being particularly mine, are actually you know from my notebooks as a journalist. You know, and I do mention one or two. You know, when I travel, you know, travel traveling with Thatcher and things. But so uh, there's an accumulation, an agglomeration of uh, of knowledge, as it were, and some of it's there in old notebooks. A lot of it's there in old stories that I and columns that I write. Now, what do you what do you learn? Um, I think the first thing you learn, it's, and it's a bit frightening, is that our politicians are woefully ignorant when it comes to the world. Um, and actually, Tony Blair has sort of admitted this almost since that you know they arrive in in office with all this power and you know power at home, but power in foreign policy, I really know nothing about, you know, Tony Blair knew nothing about the, um, the Middle East uh, while he was in office. In fact, I once admonished him, because I studied history at university, so I feel I'm still a sort of at least a historian monke or whatever. I once admonished him for not thinking, of, not thinking, you know, clearly not really understanding what had happened at Suez, for example, before he went into the war in Iraq. Um, so, and again, it's this sort of legacy, I think, of empire. These politicians don't really think that they need to spend a lot of time learning. I mean, there are exceptions to this. When Douglas Hurd was foreign secretary, he spent a lot of time trying to get fellow ministers to, to get to know personally their European Union counterparts so they could build relationships and have, you know, not just meet formally, but meet informally and get together. But very few responded to that. We, we, you know, we like to go abroad and come home and think being at home is much more. The exception, of course, is the US where there is this, because we are the junior partner, there is this race to get to the White House. It is a sort of golden rule has been of, you know, British politics that, the prime minister has to be the first, to first European at least, to get to the White House to meet the US president. Uh, it's not gonna happen this time, it's gonna be Angela Merkel who's going next month to meet Biden. So that perhaps tells you something. But um, so that ignorance and is in, in a way, I think fright is the thing funny. Um, I, I think the good ones, they learn very quickly. I think that ethically, I would say the prime ministers that I've known, um, you know, have, have had an ethical code. It, you know, they may have done things I firmly sort of disagreed with or others would have disagreed with or, or were, you know, just plain wrong. But these aren't people who are, you know, just sort of 
you know, let loose to, to sort of, you know, think they can wreak havoc or do what they want or do as they please. I think our foreign policy has been grounded in a certain uh, set of values and a certain consciousness of, um, you know, democracy and freedom uh, and, uh, uh, and, yeah, a, a, moral, a moral sort of code. Thanks. Um, so one question that I, 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 um, I don't think I can resist asking you uh, in this particular case um, is that um, there's obviously a sense in which the story that you tell in your book is not a completely linear one, because, of course, we go from Suez to, uh, to uh, entering and voting to stay in the European market. And then uh, at the end of the story that you tell, we, of course, leave with, Bre with Brexit. And which is a kind of reversal of that middle middle part of the story. Um, given that reversal, um, I wondered who you thought out of uh, the cast of uh, prime ministers involved here was was kind of most to blame for that reversal. Uh, uh, given that's the way that, that that a lot of people would would want to see the problem, is it is it Thatcher or Blair or or of course Cameron who we might see as being most to blame for Britain falling out of that. Uh, relationship with Europe. Europe. I tell you, I think it's. I, I'm. I actually do have a clear answer. And I think, and it's Thatcher and Blair. Um, and the reason is that these were the two prime ministers who were strong enough. Thatcher in seventy nine, Blair in ninety seven, to have said to the country, "Look, we're going to shape a new role for ourselves in Europe, and put it together." with our relationship with the US and build a stable, if you like, framework for our foreign policy. And Thatcher could have done that. She was strong enough. She could have taken her party. She could have taken the country. And instead, she fell into this, you know, Atlanticist, I've got to get on with Reagan. And isn't it fun being at the White House and the reflected glory, the stardust you get from, you know, being at the White House. And then the thing we haven't mentioned, this sort of nuclear obsession, you know, that we, we, you know, we're going to have, we've got to have nuclear weapons and the Americans are the only one who can supply it. So we've got to keep in with the Americans to, in her case, to replace Polaris with Trident. Now, equally, Blair, who was intuitively a pro-European in night and, and started off, you know, making all the right noises was equally strong or even stronger in 97. He had that massive majority. The Conservatives had been smashed. And he could have said, right, we're, you know, we're really now, gonna, I'm going to show what leadership in Europe means for Britain and actually come back and tell people what we're achieving in Europe. And what he did instead, what he did was he gave lots of pro-European speeches. I was at a number of them. And they were mostly in foreign capitals. They were in Warsaw, in Prague, because at home, Rupert Murdoch and the Sun newspaper and whatever were constantly pressuring him, saying, you can't join the Euro, you, you know, the, the, the Europeans are trying to sort of, you know, end Thatcherism. And he fell into that, I think I would say weakness. And he also fell into the pro-American trap, you know, Whatever happens, we've got to keep on side with the Americans. I mean, I, you know, I'll give away. I remember a private conversation with him, just the two of us, um, uh, in about a year before the Iraq War, and we were talking about, you know, how far you go with the Americans, you know, and were we going to be? I was asking, were we going to be pulled into a war in Iraq? And he said, it's my, it's the duty of a British Prime Minister to get on with the US president. And that seemed to sort of take over, you know, that, that seemed to sort of replace everything else. So I think, yeah, I'm absolutely clear the two prime ministers who could have really set a strong Atlanticist, but, Euro but also European framework um, and uh, for our foreign policy were Thatcher and Blair, and they both missed it. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, one, one thing that might be interesting to, um, I thought would be interesting to hear your thoughts on is, 
I've often thought that it was somehow inevitable that the first Conservative Prime Minister with a majority after Maastricht, so yeah, post-major, would be forced to have a referendum on the EU. That it was just simply, uh, and something that you, you depict rather well in your, your, your book as being um, an issue that just burns for a certain faction of the Tory party from that point onwards. And having been denied uh, the kind of say that they wanted over it at the time, that, that, that a Conservative Prime Minister with, with a majority would be forced into having it. So, um, so the idea that maybe Cameron uh, didn't need to hold that referendum. That there's an argument that says that, that any Conservative Prime Minister would have would have uh, been forced to have it, and that it was somehow inevitable that they would lose it uh, if if it was held. And that's of course the reason why people like George Osborne didn't want to have a referendum in the first place. So I wonder what you thought about that. I think that um, there was always going to be pressure. But I mean, remember, Cameron offered this referendum in 2013 when he was still in, in, um, in government with the Lib Dems. In the month he off, offered the referendum, if you looked at the polling, where they, the pollsters asked people to rate the issues that most concern them from one to 10, you know, health, education, Europe was about number nine or 10. So people were not, Europe was an issue that, if you put it to a sizable minority of the electorate, burnt very brightly as an important issue, but it wasn't an issue that the country as a whole was you know, obsessed with. Now you say the Conservative Party, look, you know, the, the UKIP and Nigel Farage was, whatever you think of his politics was brilliant in this, had done very well politically in crude political terms, linking immigration and Europe, and globalization and turning the whole Brexit thing into, you know, a, a revolt against the elites rather than just a revolt against the EU. So Cameron was certainly under pressure, but I didn't believe then and I don't believe now. And, you know, and, you know, George Osborne doesn't believe now that it would have been impossible to resist that pressure. They would have had a rough time. They would have had rebellions. They might have had to rely on the Labour Party from time to time to get votes through. But then, you know, Edward Heath had relied on the Labour Party to get us into the EU, you know, back in 1973. So, so I think it, no, I don't think it was inevitable. I also think it was completely crazy to have the timing, you know, we're just coming out of austerity, or we're still in austerity. The migration crisis of 2015, you know, but our television screens have been full of these pictures of, you know, migrants coming over the Mediterranean. And you hold a referendum in those, you know, a few months after that. You know, so even if one thought at some point, um, and this was this was to do. I, I, I will let everyone give a, 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 another indiscretion. This was a prime minister who didn't think about foreign policy. When I soon after he became prime minister, and I think I may say this in the book, but there was a civil servant I was having lunch with, and he worked with the prime minister, and I, I was just asking him about how Cameron worked. You know, no, nothing, no great secrets, but you know, does he read his papers? carefully does he read them in the morning in the evening what's he like at meetings towards the end of this I said to the civil servant so what does he think about the world and the civil servant looked up and it was like something out of yes minister he looked up and he said I'm afraid the prime minister thinks the world is somewhere where you go on holiday <laughs> and at the time I didn't write that because I thought it was so the Oomba and so sort of yes ministerish but as time went by that became a perfect description of david cameron's worldview well i think that uh in the very short time that we have left i think that uh, i can i can sum up a number of the uh, audience questions uh, quite simply really as um well 
what next for the UK? And I guess in looking to narrow that down, is there is there a specific issue you would see as being the thing that will dominate what the UK tries to do next in this, this new, new situation it finds itself? I think we're going to have a period of relative hardship once we get through this COVID and bump or whatever, relative hardship in which we'll see that there is a cost to Brexit. Um, I don't think this generation of politicians is going to recognise, will accept that this have, will have anything to do with Brexit. Then I think over the next 5, 10, 15 years, those realities I mentioned later, our economic connections, our security dependence, our cultural exchanges, our geography, all those things will reassert themselves. And at some point in the next five, 10 years, people will seriously start to say, not necessarily should we join, rejoin the EU, how do we rebuild a relationship with our neighbours, our friends, our fellow democracies on our own continent? That's, of course, assuming that Scotland hasn't left the UK Union before that. Okay, well, that's a very thought-provoking note on which to end. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been Thank a you. fascinating discussion. Uh, and uh, I just want to repeat uh, and remind everyone that a recording of that uh, conversation, a recording of the event is available on the Festival YouTube channel, which can be accessed from the Watch Again section of the Festival website. Uh, after the 20th of June. Uh, you'll be contacted by email when the video is available to view. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Philip's book, and I, I recommend that you do, uh, copies of Britain Alone are available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Uh, more information on book sales, please visit the website or head direct to foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival of ideas. Um, we very much hope that you will continue to be engaged with the York Festival Ideas. Uh, please check out the website for full details of all other events in the festival programme. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on these events and continue the conversations using the hashtag, uh, hashtag York Ideas. So once again, Philip, thanks very much for uh, coming along this evening. It's been a fascinating conversation uh, and I look forward to reading more of your work in the future. Chris, thank you very much. Thanks. It's been great.